You've known about lead-acid storage batteries for years. In your car, for instance, the familiar starting and lighting battery, consisting of three or six identical cells. The Navy, of course, uses lead-acid batteries in a variety of shapes and sizes and capacities. From portable batteries for starting engines, for auxiliary lighting, for fire control and communication systems, and so on, to the mammoth submarine battery, here, just one cell weighs from one-half to three-quarters of a ton. Whatever their size, shape, capacity, number of cells, or application, all lead-acid batteries store chemical energy and convert this to electrical energy when needed. In this film, you will see how chemical energy is converted into electrical energy and learn some of the effects of this conversion. The principal chemical ingredients of the battery give it its name. The most abundant ingredient in the battery is lead. There are a number of lead plates in each cell, from 49 to 77 in each cell of a submarine battery, depending on the type. Here's one negative plate designated by a minus sign. Behind a separator and retainer, a positive plate with its plus sign. The negative plate is made of pure lead, which is soft and spongy and called sponge lead. The positive plate's active material is a lead compound, brownish colored, called either lead dioxide or lead peroxide. The terms are interchangeable, but we'll use only one of them here to avoid confusion, lead dioxide. Now, if we took our negative plate and our positive plate and placed them in a jar filled with an electrolyte, we would have a cell. The electrolyte we are using is sulfuric acid mixed with water. Sponge lead, lead dioxide, sulfuric acid. These are the chemicals that give the cell its name, lead acid. To understand how these chemicals react with each other to produce electrical energy, we must recall the electron theory. As you know, the world is made of tiny molecules of matter, the smallest particles of a substance that still retain all the characteristics of the substance. Molecules, in turn, are made of one or more kinds of atoms, which are the smallest units of the 102 known chemical elements, like hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, lead, and so on. Each atom contains positive and negative charges of electricity. A positive charge is called a proton. A negative charge is an electron. Normally, an atom is electrically balanced. The number of protons in the nucleus of the atom equals the number of electrons circling around the nucleus. This is the simplest atom known, hydrogen, containing just one proton and one electron. Other elements are more complex in structure. The oxygen atom, for example, contains eight protons and orbiting around them are eight electrons. Again, notice that the oxygen atom is electrically balanced. Four elements are involved in the lead acid cell, hydrogen and oxygen, lead, of course, and sulfur. Using their standard chemical symbols, oxygen is O, and this is one atom of oxygen. Hydrogen is H, sulfur is S, and lead is Pb. The negative plate in our lead acid cell is pure sponge lead, and we'll represent it by the Pb symbol for the lead atom. 
The positive plate is a compound, lead dioxide. And each molecule consists of one lead atom and two oxygen atoms, PbO2. A third form of lead is lead sulfate. Its molecule combines a lead atom with a sulfur atom and four oxygen atoms, PbSO4. For the electrolyte in our cell, we have sulfuric acid, each molecule consisting of two hydrogen atoms, one sulfur atom, and four oxygen atoms, H2SO4. The sulfuric acid is diluted by water, and of course, a molecule of water contains two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, H2O. These then are the chemicals and elements in your battery. The various elements have strong attractions for each other and not necessarily for the union shown here. For example, if we take water, pure distilled H2O and concentrated sulfuric acid, H2SO4, and add the sulfuric acid to the water, a peculiar reaction takes place in some of the sulfuric acid molecules. They break up. That is, the two hydrogen atoms separate from the SO4 molecule. But they don't get away as complete atoms. Each one loses its negative electron to the SO4 molecule. Thus, instead of being neutral electrically, with its negative electron balancing its positive proton, each hydrogen atom carries a single positive charge. But the SO4 molecule, having gained two extra electrons, now carries a double negative charge. Throughout the cell, countless sulfuric acid molecules are separated this way. The process of decomposing substances into charged particles is known as ionization. The positively charged particles are positive ions. The negatively charged particles are the negative ions. Ionization is the key to understanding the chemistry of the lead acid cell. When pure lead is immersed in the electrolyte, the sulfuric acid causes lead atoms to ionize. Specifically, two electrons leave each lead atom, giving us a lead ion with a double positive charge and two free electrons. Since this process is taking place throughout the lead plate, one result is a significant supply of free electrons making the plate electrically negative. The lead is spongy in character so that the acid comes in contact with as much lead as possible. When a lead dioxide plate is immersed in the electrolyte, ionization takes place again, but this time it's a little more complicated. In order to show it, we need one molecule of lead dioxide, PbO2, and two molecules of water. The lead dioxide breaks up into one lead and two oxygen atoms. The two water molecules between them provide four hydrogen atoms and two more oxygen atoms. Sorting them out, we have one lead atom four hydrogen atoms, and four oxygen atoms. The oxygen and hydrogen atoms combine to form not water this time, but a special chemical unit known as the hydroxyl radical, four of them. Meanwhile, the lead atom releases electrons, one electron into each hydroxyl radical. This leaves the lead atom four electrons short. It now is a four plus lead ion, electrically positive four times over.
the hydroxyl radicals float off in the electrolyte, but the positive lead ion remains at the plate. And since the entire plate is subject to this ionization, it is strongly positive electrically. Thus, chemical action produces an electrical difference between the two plates. And this difference is called an electromotive force, or EMF. We have a surplus of electrons at the negative plate and a deficiency at the positive plate. All we need to do now is provide an external path for them to travel, a conductor between the two plates. The current flowing from negative to positive can be put to work, lighting a lamp, for instance. At the same time, further chemical changes are taking place. As we saw earlier, ionization at the negative plate produced a lead ion with a double positive charge. And ionization of the electrolyte produced an SO4 ion with a double negative charge. Ions with equal charges of opposite sign combine readily. So the sulfate ions move through the solution and combine with lead ions to form an electrically balanced molecule of lead sulfate, PbSO4. A similar action takes place at the positive plate, but in a different way. Here, ionization had given us a lead ion with four positive charges. Now the flow of electricity through the wire is bringing three electrons to the positive plate. Each four plus lead ion picks up two free electrons and is thereby transformed into a two plus or double positive ion, such as we saw at the negative plate. It can then combine with the nearest SO4 double negative ion to form a molecule of lead sulfate, again, electrically balanced. We still have the negative hydroxyls that resulted from the ionization of lead dioxide and water and the positive hydrogen ions from the ionization of sulfuric acid. Equal charges of opposite sign tend to combine. We get therefore molecules consisting of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms, H2O, water. To summarize how chemical energy is converted into electrical energy. When two plates made of dissimilar metals, lead and lead dioxide, are immersed in a solution of sulfuric acid and water, chemical action causes the lead to become negatively charged and the lead dioxide to become positively charged. If a conductor is provided between them, Electrical current will flow from the negative plate to the positive plate through the conductor. The cell is said to be discharging. As discharging continues, more and more of each plate becomes lead sulfate. And much of the sulfuric acid in the electrolyte is consumed in the formation of lead sulfate. The concentration of sulfuric acid drops considerably and the solution becomes almost plain water. When the concentration of sulfuric acid drops to a certain value, the battery must be charged. To do this, replace the load with a DC generator. Hook it up so that it drives a current in the direction opposite to that during discharge. The generator provides sufficient electrical energy to completely reverse the chemical reactions in the battery. As a result, the positive plate again becomes lead dioxide and the negative plate becomes lead. The sulfate driven off the plates into the water combines with hydrogen ions becoming sulfuric acid in solution. When chemical energy in a battery is converted to electrical energy, the effects of this conversion are of direct concern to you. They include a change in the electrolyte, the formation of gases, change in plate volume, the generation of heat, and loss of water. 
let's consider the practical effects of the change in the electrolyte. We said that the electrolyte is a mixture of sulfuric acid and water. The pure concentrated acid is much heavier than water, almost twice as heavy. If this much water weighs one pound, the same amount of pure concentrated sulfuric acid weighs 1.84 pounds. The acid is more dense. In actual practice, the way you measure density is with a hydrometer. The hydrometer float, which submerges this much in water, when transferred to sulfuric acid, will ride high. The greater density of the acid buoys up the float more than water does. Any mixture of water and acid will buoy up the hydrometer float somewhere between these limits. The stem of the float is calibrated. The numbers are direct readings of the density of the liquid. Notice that water is given the value of one. These are specific gravity readings. To water, with a specific gravity of one, acid may be added until the specific gravity of the electrolyte mixture increases to 1.250. This is the specific gravity of the electrolyte mixture that the Navy uses in many submarine batteries. In a fully charged cell, the electrolyte is sulfuric acid and water mixed to a given specific gravity, that is, 1.250, commonly expressed as 1250. During discharge, as we saw a few minutes ago, some of the sulfuric acid, H2SO4, is ionized, and its hydrogen ions go off to form water. More water and less acid means the electrolyte becomes dilute as the cell is discharged and its specific gravity goes down. This change in specific gravity is a sure clue, therefore, to the state of charge of the cell. And the hydrometer makes it an easy phenomenon to detect. Correspondingly, as the battery is charged, the sulfate leaves the plates, recombines with hydrogen to form sulfuric acid, and the specific gravity of the electrolyte increases. During battery operation, there is a formation of dangerous gases, principally hydrogen gas, which is molecular hydrogen, each molecule consisting of two hydrogen atoms, and oxygen gas, each molecule of which consists of two oxygen atoms. These gases are a potentially explosive combination. When the cell is on discharge or stand, small amounts of hydrogen gas are formed around the negative plate. Positive hydrogen ions in the electrolyte meet strictly balanced atom of hydrogen result. Two of these atoms unite forming a molecule of H2, hydrogen gas. This is part of the process which goes on even when the battery is not being used. Putting the battery on charge produces both hydrogen and oxygen gases in substantial quantities. The oxygen usually shows up first at the positive plate. Later in the charge, Hydrogen appears at the negative plate, gradually increasing until its proportion to oxygen is two to one. Incidentally, this gassing serves a useful purpose, thoroughly mixing the electrolyte to a uniform strength throughout the cell. What's happening here is the electrolysis of water, which we have seen before without naming it. Current from the charging generator passes through the electrolyte and ionizes the water molecules into negative hydroxyl ions and positive hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions act as they do in chemical self-discharge, 
picking up free electrons at the negative plate and becoming electrically balanced atoms which combine into molecules of hydrogen gas. The negative hydroxyl, or OH ions, head for the positive plate where they lose their extra electrons. We now have four electrically balanced hydroxyl radicals containing four hydrogen atoms and four oxygen atoms. The hydrogen atoms and two of the oxygen atoms recombine as two molecules of water. But the remaining two oxygen atoms unite to form a molecule of oxygen gas. Notice that out of our original four molecules of water, we get two molecules of hydrogen and one of oxygen, two to one, the proportion in which the gases are evolved. In addition, other gases may result from impurities in the cell. For example, if salt water gets in the electrolyte, harmful chlorine gas will be evolved at all stages of operation, including stand. The plates may increase in thickness during discharge and shrink during charge. During discharge, the lead of the negative plate changes to lead sulfate and, of course, so does the lead dioxide of the positive plate. Now, lead sulfate is not as dense as the other forms of lead. It has more bulk, a greater volume of material per plate. If you examine the actual plates thoroughly after normal discharge, you would find no apparent change in size. The plates are quite porous, and the expanded material simply fills the pores. But if the discharge period is abnormally long, excessive expansion may take place. Similarly, normal charging will bring the plates back to their original porosity. But overcharging the cell may cause the negative plate to shrink excessively separating the sponge lead from the grid structure that supports it. The activity going on in the cell usually generates heat. During both charge and discharge, there is some heat from the electrical resistance of the plates and other parts of the cell. Usually, there is a greater amount of heat from the chemical reactions when the cell is on charge. The temperatures produced while the battery is gassing can become high enough to be harmful. The rule is that the temperature of the electrolyte of a battery on charge shall never exceed 130 degrees. It shall never exceed 155 degrees under any circumstances. The loss of water occurs two ways. Heat evaporates it, and electrolysis decomposes it. That's why frequent measurements must be taken of the height of the electrolyte with a height stick. Variations in the height of the electrolyte due to water loss affect specific gravity readings. These must then be corrected according to the instructions for the battery in question. When chemical energy is converted to electrical energy, there are changes in the electrolyte. Dangerous gases are evolved. The plates change in volume. Heat is generated, and water is lost from the battery. Study your battery manufacturer's instruction book and the Ship's manual, chapter 62, section 3. Your familiarity with these publications is vital to your ship.